This is our evening session of the second day of the Degrowth Conference in Budapest. And we are, four of us here, keen on discussing challenging degrowth as an idea. So we love to have you, all of you, with us for an hour and a half, if it works out. So let me introduce first for myself, uh, as my role is facilitating this uh, evening discussion. I'm George Pataki, uh, based at this university, at the Corvinus Business School, uh, Department of Decision Sciences. And my role, my pleasure, is uh, this evening to facilitate a discussion on capitalism and D grows, but the D is in brackets. So we will not only challenge, as today is the day of challenges, as far as I learned from the organizers. So we will challenge not only capitalism, but we are intending to challenge the growth. And I am not alone of this challenge, uh, challenging day, but uh, three distinguished speakers and uh, debaters will be with us tonight or this evening. But before introducing them, just to have some uh, think about the rules of the game, just to have on the same platform what we can expect uh, this evening. So uh, the first round of contributions will be maximum 10 minutes contributions by each speakers. Uh, on challenging capitalism. And uh, I'm quite uh, rigorous with the time, so I will stand up if it is over or, and it's too much over. So I will <laughs> ask everybody to have a very intensive and to contribute to a very intensive, lively dialogue and debate and not to take uh, and not to use the power of the time and the power of uh, us, our time as discussant here. So the first round will be maximum 10 minutes by each, then challenging capitalism, then we turn to challenges on the ground. So we will share, three speakers will share with us their experience on the ground transition experiences, so to say, from different parts of the world, from different perspectives. And finally, we will challenge degrowth. At least we will have a discussion on uh, what we can expect and how we can make meaningful change at the system level, systems level and how degrowth can contribute or what are maybe the weaknesses. So I'm also open to uh, challenge degrowth and hope we will hear some critical remarks as well. And then hopefully we'll open up to questions and answers, but at this uh, uh, very early uh, start, I would like to also ask you to be constructive in the sense not to, when you have the word, not to take mu too much time to comment or, and uh, just to focus on challenging questions or very short remarks, okay? Just to let as many people to contribute as possible and as dynamic discussion as possible. Okay, so if it's acceptable, uh, and this is my power <laughs> to force it on you, this schedule, uh, I would like to turn to introducing our uh, speakers tonight. So I will start with Jennifer Hinton, and uh, you should know that Jen is a co-director of the Post Growth Institute, which is a network of researchers and activists uh, working globally as well as locally. And although she's originally from Colorado, the USA, uh, she lived in Greece, especially during the economic crisis time. So she has real life experience working in a, a specific situation in Europe with again, local initiatives and global networks all together. And uh, what is also important, at, at, at least to me, we share, I think, with Jen, this that she is keen on bridging activism, research, and business. Uh, so we will uh, see how it influences her perspective. And she is co-author of a forthcoming book on how on earth 
flourishing in a not-for-profit world. So I do hope that we will see a utopian vision, maybe, of a not-for-profit world and learn from it. Uh, secondly, we have Dan, Dan, Daniel O'Neill, Dan O'Neill, a lecturer in ecological economics at the University of Leeds, UK, and chief economist at the Center for the Advancement of the Steady State Economy. Uh, he's originally from British Columbia, Canada, as far as I learned today, uh, and, uh, but he's working in the UK now. And his research focuses on the changes that uh, needs, uh, that we need to achieve a sustainable economy within planetary boundaries, as well as he's doing research on the relationship between resource use and human well-being. And he's co-author uh, recently a book on Enough is Enough, Building a sustainable economy in a world of finite resources. And you can also, if you prefer visuals, then you can see the film on this book, which will be shown tomorrow at 4.30 p.m., uh, uh, included in the program of this conference, the Degrowth Week. And we have here Susan Paulson from uh, Florida, uh, she is a professor at the Center for Latin American Studies, University of Florida, trained as an anthropologist, but also I read that she's a political ecologist, uh, which is really exemplified her book from uh, uh, 2005, Political Ecology Across Spaces, Scales, and Social Groups. Uh, her anthropological work is really f uh, focusing on interacting uh, Gender, how gender, class, ethnicity interacts with the biophysical environment. So she's really doing research on bodies and landscapes as an anthropologist. And she lived in Latin America for 15 years in Bolivia and Brazil. And she has a widespread experience in working with local people, local communities, and that we share with uh, Susan, favoring methods, methodologies that is based on working together with the local people. So our first speaker will be Susan. Please take the floor. What is capitalism? A state? An institution? Some values? Power structure? Ideology? A culture? What governs capitalism? Supply and demand? Invisible hand? Enclosure of land? The need to expand? Market mechanism, class schism, racism, the moral virtue of productivism, laissez-faire, free market, free trade, free enterprise, freedom to buy, wage, slavery, and debt, innovation, invest, impress, progress, entrepreneurial quest for technological success in pursuit of profit. Self-interest, ambition, addiction, friction, cutthroat competition, eat or be eaten, grow or die. Thank you. Um, I think about capitalism, or perhaps capitalisms, as a moment, a blink in time. Organic life has thrived on Earth for four billion years. Modern humans have been walking around for 200,000 years, looking a lot like me and you. That magic moment of capitalism dawned just 500 years ago with European colonial expansion which enabled the rise of fossil-fueled industrial economies. Vital to that rise were hierarchical class, gender, and ethno-racial systems that interact with markets to engineer and to justify unequal exchange. Those who engage in markets from superior positions get more for their money. Net ecological value flows toward them, towards us, where capital accumulates. Those who sell labor and other resources from inferior positions get drained, degraded, deforested, 
impoverished, exhausted. Cultural exchange flows in the other direction. Power dynamics have impelled capitalist practices, values, and myths all over the world with very little exchange of cultural traditions. And that's our problem. Cultural features of capitalism now seem so omnipresent that it's difficult to imagine or to forge alternatives. And all that happened in just a moment in time. The most ingenious move of modernism, moderni modernism was to the perception that this moment fills all horizons. Now, left and right, pro-growth and degrowth are all slugging it out in a tiny little capitalocentric arena. For me, the biggest challenge of degrowth is the shallow historical depth and the narrow cultural scope that circumscribe contemporary debates about environment and about life. What to do about it? How to break out? Debunk myths that naturalize features of capitalism, learn from all kinds of social natural worlds, and forge systems driven by desires other than growth. Degrowth is denounced as eco-fascism, ideologically driven imposition that would force unwilling victims to sacrifice their God-given freedoms and their innate self-interest. Capitalism, in contrast, is perceived as apolitical, and morally neutral. Markets, in particular, appear as timeless mechanisms through which all humans freely organize livelihoods and establish value. Karl Polanyi showed they are anything but. The commodification of labor and nature, together with colonization of human practice and worldview by market relations and money, are historical exceptions brutally imposed in 18th and 19th century Britain in efforts to mold human nature for industrial growth. Moving to the late 20th century, David Harvey and others have exposed the formidable political incursions that have forced free market relations into the most isolated parts of the world and the most intimate dimensions of human relationships. Our stubborn blindness to these and other historical facts is enabled by certain architectural features of Western language, science, and philosophy, namely hierarchical binaries. Binaries of white over non-white, man over woman, humans over other nature, are so engraved in the landscape that it's very difficult for us to question unequal exchange, even by those most exploited. The nature-culture binary marks thinking humans as superior over instinct-driven beasts, but it also cements as natural instinct those aspects of human life that shouldn't be questioned. Today, the conviction that human biology is responsible for the insatiable drive to increase production and consumption is fostered by powerful cultural and scientific myths Homo economicus, that innately rational agent maximizing utility for personal gain. How about that selfish gene that makes each of us crave control over resources and strive to get more than our share, condemning to tragedy any attempt at commons government? Even the Anthropocene is portrayed as driven by human evolution. Teleological narratives surrounding climate change are exemplified by Stefan Kretzen and McNeil, who write, quote, the first use of fire by our bipedal ancestors, Homo erectus, occurred a couple million years ago. The mastery of fire by our ancestors provided mankind with a powerful tool unavailable to other species that put us firmly on the long path towards the Anthropocene. Just as the power to shape planetary climate passes from nature into the realm of humans, it is re-naturalized as unchangeable human nature. Antonio Gramsci taught us, how, beware the power of cultural constructs that make status quo appear natural and inevitable. He also noted that historical crisis can destabilize that power, 
opening possibilities for transformation. Let's seize the opportunity to shake up those myths. <laughs> all right, learning from all kinds of socio-natural worlds offers us historical depth. Archaeological evidence demonstrates that diverse hunter-gatherer fisher cultures with extremely low social metabolism, little or no market activity, have thrived throughout human history and still today. Certainly they've impacted and co-constructed ecosystems, but there's no evidence that they changed the course of Earth systems. Evidence points to very gradual expansion of per capita societal metabolism in some populations starting about 10,000 years ago with the birth of agriculture and urbanization. Then, with that magic moment of capitalism, just a few hundred years ago, increase in per capita ecological footprint until the late 20th century when a miraculous erection of supercharged growth changed the world corresponding with extremely high levels of CO2 or skyrocketing levels of CO2. So putting that latter moment into deeper historical context reveals the absurdity of evolutionary causation of what's happening. It also helps us answer questions like, how can humanity progress without capitalist motivation? And how can non-expanding economies even sustain human society? That's where cross-cultural awareness comes in. I've been learning with a network of scholars, many of them here, yeah, raise your hands, yay! <laughs> Working in 20 different countries, some with booming economic and material growth, others facing post-growth, or having missed out on growth altogether. We find promising practice and meanings in long-sustained arrangements, among forced adaptations, and also amid innovations towards new visions. You can learn about these diverse cultural paths at our two sessions, tomorrow and the next day. They're both called Forging New Old Sociocultural Systems Driven by Motives Other Than Growth. And you can also find it in a journal of political ecological the Journal of Political Ecology will publish our papers, 16 of our papers, about in about a month, in a, in a special issue called Degrowth, Culture, and Power. All right, the purpose of all these studies is not to promote a return to primitive life or to third world conditions. On the contrary, awareness of many possible modes of life, many possible sources of richness and human pleasure, widens our horizons for building unprecedented futures. So I conclude by turning to the furnace where those futures are forged. Behaviors and values that drive capitalist growth are not natural. They're artifacts of recent systems of culture and power. But there is something about human biology that's relevant. Creatures interacting in the Earth's ecosystems display amazing characteristics evolved to meet their needs and to assure their descendant survival. Among them, human individuals do not shine as strong, as quick, as smart. Forget it. We're, we're not even competitive as individuals. What does stand out is our biophysical capacity for symbolic thought and communication enables humans to collaboratively develop cultural systems that survive the individual organism and that in turn shape the production of the next generation of homo sapiens, its habits, its habitats. These uniquely human systems take the form of languages, religions, sciences, production, kinship, and gender systems. They are our most fundamental commons. That is where the growth imperative came from, and that is where we are already making changes to support equitable and pleasurable degrowth. Thank you. I'm wondering if I need this microphone or if you can hear me with the, the little microphone that's up here. Can you guys hear me? 
Okay, I'll put this one down then. So I have a feeling that uh, capitalism is maybe going to be a bit criticized by this panel. I think it's been sold to you as a debate, and I think perhaps the organizers thought as a steady state economist I might give a more sympathetic view of capitalism. Um, maybe I will, maybe I won't. I've at least worn a suit to give capitalism a bit of balance and a say. The question I want to try and tackle in the short time I have is whether there's a growth imperative within capitalism. Now, we know that growth can certainly occur without capitalism. Uh, many former communist countries are examples of this. But is capitalism without growth possible? In other words, can we have a steady state economy, an economy with a stable level of material and energy use under a capitalist system? And assuming for a moment that we could, would any of us want to live there? To answer these questions, though, we really need to be clear about what we mean by capitalism. And this is not a trivial matter. Uh, a guy with a great beard named Karl Marx spent much of his life and wrote over 3,000 words on this topic. And pretty much anything that I can say about this is going to trivialize uh, and be a terrible simplification of this idea. But let me give you a four-point definition of capitalism, if I may. So point number one. There are capitalists. And these are people who own the means of production. Point number two, everyone else works for these capitalists in exchange for wages. Point number three, capitalists don't just own the capital, but they own the things that are produced by the people working for them. And they sell these in markets to make a profit. Which brings us to point number four, and that is that the capitalists are motivated in where they invest, in what they produce, by whether or not it's profitable. Now, I'm going to be a little bit polemic here and say that there are no capitalist economies, no true capitalist economies. Capitalism is an idealized system. And even in the most capitalist countries, there are things which are not controlled by the capitalists and are controlled by the state, uh, the national health system in many countries, universities, even the railways in some fortunate countries, unlike England, unfortunately. <laughs> and in fact, to work, capitalism pretty much relies on this. It relies on there being things which are not within the capitalist system that it can mosey over to and take control of. And this is the, pro the, 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 the project of commodification. And neoliberalism, this, this grand project, is really the idea of taking these hybrid economies and turning them into these idealized capitalist systems. And you know it's been pretty successful. Now, to answer the question, of whether there's a growth imperative within capitalism, we really need to talk about profit. And this goes back to my, my four-point definition where I said that capitalists are motivated in their decision-making by profit. And profit and growth are certainly related, but they're not the same thing. Profit is the difference between a firm's revenues and, and its costs. So if I'm in a, in a company and I make these little bottles, um, I pay a certain amount uh, to produce these and I sell them for another amount. And the difference between those, very roughly speaking, is profit. And this is different from growth, which is just me producing more and more of these uh, over time. And so we could have a situation, at least theoretically, uh, where profits are growing, but where we don't have growth, or vice versa. And so the law, the fundamental law of capitalism is really to profit or die, not to grow or die. The problem, though, is that there are a number of ways that these two things are connected. And let me just give you one example from, uh, from a paper which Beth Stratford uh, sent to me a few days ago. And I'd actually like to thank everyone from Leeds for, for helping me prepare for this presentation yesterday. We rented a small apartment here in Budapest, and we had a great discussion yesterday about capitalism. So all of the good ideas come from my colleagues. Um, all of the bad ideas come from me. Uh, so a very good paper, um, which gives you an example of how profit and growth are connected. There's a number of different ways, at least at the level of the firm. And so you may have discovered that the world is an uncertain place, and, and businesses have also discovered this. And if you're a capitalist, uh, it's uncertain whether you're going to make a profit from, from one year to the next. You know, another company, Susan might start up a company, or Jennifer, that makes better bottles than this, which cuts into my, my profits. Now, if I'm a capitalist and I want to safeguard myself against going out of business, a very good strategy for me is to try and take over more market share, to try and put my competitors out of business. And so there is a built-in profit imperative, or rather, sorry, a growth imperative 
uh, at the level of the firm uh, just to expand in order to stay in business. So profit or die becomes grow or die after all. But here's the thing. The micro level does not necessarily equal the macro level. Uh, and it's growth in the macro economy that we as the degrowth community are really concerned with. Some firms may grow, but at the same time, other firms may go out of business. And there's many of very good examples in nature where the individual agents have a growth imperative, but the system as a whole does not. Uh, one of the simplest of these is a forest. Uh, the individual agents, they're called trees, uh, they compete against one another uh, for something called sunlight, and they grow, and yet the total size of the forest can remain constant over time. And so, the issue, I think, is, is a complicated one about whether this growth imperative at the level of the firm translates then into a growth imperative at the level of the, the whole economy. So let's you know, think or suggest for a moment that maybe a steady state capitalist economy is possible, at least technically, but is it still the kind of place where you'd want to live? And, and this is where the real problem starts, I think. Um, and there's at least two big problems for a capitalist steady state economy. The first of these is inequality. And these individual firms, they have this, this motivation to accumulate. And the more money that you have, the more money you can earn. And this results in an increase in inequality throughout society. And Thomas Piketty has shown this very well in his book, Capital in the 21st Century. He shows that if the profit rate uh, is greater than the economic growth rate, then the capitalists get richer. If that economic growth rate is zero, then the capitalists get richer and everyone else gets poorer. It's a zero-sum game. And although definitions of degrowth vary, it's generally defined as a transition for both ecological sustainability and social equity. And so here we have a system, capitalism, which is going against one of the key elements of degrowth, this element of social equity. And it's not just the inequality that's the problem. And this is really the key thing. It's the power relations that go along with this. Because as these capitalists become richer, uh, they accumulate more power as well. And this means that they can lobby government for the kinds of policies that they want. And they can lobby against the kind of changes, taxes on resource use, limits to resource use, and so on, that might be needed to achieve a steady state economy. So here we have effectively a feedback loop through inequality which is working against this whole idea of a capitalist steady state economy. The other big problem, and this goes back to my, my convenient four point definition, is that it's the capitalists who are deciding where to invest in the economy. And they're doing this based on the profit motive. And there's no real reason to think that they're going to, in, going to invest in the things, the social, the environmental objectives that we need to move towards a more environmental and socially sustainable economy. There's a very good book and film, um, Besides Enough is Enough, uh, called The Corporation by Joel Bakken, which some of you may have, may have seen or read. And in that film, they describe shareholder-owned corporations as externalizing machines that externalize every possible cost in order to maximize profits, acting selfishly and immorally in a manner similar to disordered psychopaths. And so why would we expect these institutions to act any differently in a steady state economy. So to summarize, capitalism and a steady state economy, they may be compatible, um, although there is certainly a growth imperative, I think, at the level of the firm. It's an open question whether that really does translate into one at the level of the macro economy. However, just because these two things may be compatible doesn't mean it's desirable. There's no reason to think that these profit-seeking firms are gonna generate the kind of social and environmental outcomes that we need for degrowth and perhaps more fundamentally, I think capitalism works against this fundamental aspect required for degrowth, namely social equity. All right, well, I'll stay with the trend of talking with the little microphone if it works for everybody. Yeah, cool, okay. Um, so, I actually wanna go back a little bit um, to, to Susan's beautiful poetic presentation um, and go back to the stories, stories that guide and define and shape our system, our economic system and society in general. Um, 
So we have this story of a, a greedy, self-interested human nature, homo economist, the economic man that Susan mentioned. Um, and that's based in this wider story about evolution, right? And Susan mentioned a lot of this, how, so if evolution is a mechanism of survival of the fittest and it's all based around ruthless competition, then it makes sense that we believe that human nature, in order to be um, successful, we are selfish and greedy. That's our nature, right? Um, and then that naturally <laughs> sort of leads to, in, in terms of logic, um, the, sorry, uh, the idea that we, the best way to motivate economic behavior, and I'm talking about economic behavior in all forms, in, for the firm, for consumers, for everybody in the economy, um, is to, is the profit motive, right? Is, um, to profit as much as possible. So that goes a little bit beyond your definition, Dan, of, um, profit just being the surplus in a business, um, be, uh, the surplus left over after expenses are paid for. But actually, it's the profit motive, I, I feel, and uh, what we've sort of articulated in our upcoming book with the Post Growth Institute, is it's wider than that. It's actually a lot about accumulation, right? It's about personal accumulation, the capitalist personal accumulation, um, the firm's uh, capital accumulation, and profit accumulation. Um, so we have this whole story that's led up to the economy we have now, which is based on the for-profit business model. Um, and so one of the things that we're doing in our work as a po at the Post Growth Institute is sort of reframing uh, the current economy, capitalism, as a for-profit economy. And we find that to be a really important distinction to make um, because you know, capitalism sometimes sounds very abstract, especially to non-economists or people who have not studied what capitalism is or read Marx's 3,000 words about it. Um, and so it's actually much more direct just to think of it as a for-profit economy. So it's an economy that is built around a market made of for-profit firms. What does that mean? In legal terms, a for-profit uh, business is one that has private owners, the capitalists. Um, it is motivated uh, in order to maximize its profit. So it sees profit, and this is critical, it sees profit as a goal in itself. Profit, the surplus, is not a, a means to achieving deeper or higher goals. It's profit is the goal in itself. Um, so this is uh, true of most firms in our economy, and so that's the for-profit economy. Profit is seen as a, a goal in itself, um, and that profit is uh, going to the owners of the means of production, the capitalists who own the companies. Um, so if we live in a for-profit world, which for me on this journey was a really big aha moment, like, oh, wow, so we live in a for-profit world. I never thought of it that way. Um, that does mean that we, it requires growth. And it's not only in uh, sort of mechanical terms, because I think, Dan, you made really good points about maybe it doesn't necessarily, um, capitalist economy doesn't necessarily require growth um, in the, built-in structure, but if you have this story that's guiding everybody to accumulate as much as they can, if that's the end goal of economic activity, then it does require growth. That's a psychological and a social construct that um, compels the system to constantly grow. And so if you have all of these different uh, businesses that are constantly trying to grow or die, that are constantly trying to accumulate as much as they can from the economy, um, and that's the entire economy is made up of these businesses, then that the economy is going to have to grow. Now on top of that, there, I would argue that there is something mechanically sort of built into the for-profit economy that requires growth, and that is the extraction of, uh, of wealth and money from sort of the common economy. So if you think of the common economy as a, the market economy is supposed to have circulation built into it, right? It, all of these businesses and consumers are constantly interacting and the circulation of wealth and money is supposed to happen sort of as if by an invisible hand, right? The, so it's supposed to circulate and in our book we call that the wealth circulation pump, which is supposed to be part of a, a market economy. But when you have a market economy made up of for-profit firms, then you have actually what we call the wealth extraction siphon. 
So actually the wealth is being extracted, almost as if sucked out by a siphon, um, which I don't know if, if you have a fish tank, if you don't know what a siphon is. <laughs> if you have a fish tank full of water, a siphon is what you would use to suck the water out of the fish tank. And that is essentially what's happening to the common economy of um, economic transactions through for-profit business ownership. These firms are trying to maximize profit for their owners, um, and then over time, the wealth accumulates, and it's not a surprise because accumulation of wealth is the goal of the game, right? So the wealth accumulates in sort of an elite economy, um, and that does require growth in the common economy. It requires growth of throughput to compensate for this extraction of wealth and money from the common economy, where it's just piling up in the elite economy, which is, by economist terms, called um, non-productive capital. Um, so this leads to all of, uh, well, a lot of the crises that we're seeing today, right? We're seeing ecological crises, um, which are a result of uh, a system that requires more and more throughput. We're seeing a um, crisis of well-being, uh, because consumerism has taken over our lives. As Susan rightly pointed out, it's sort of... Um, destroying our community, our family ties, our personal relationships because we are uh, bombarded by ad advertisements constantly telling us that the point of life is to consume and accumulate um, wealth and, and money. So, um, And then lastly, it's a, a crisis of economic stability. Um, and that is, is in the Guardian article that <laughs> Yorkos mentioned the other day that I wrote. Um, that basically this requirement or the goal of accumulation built into the for-profit economy um, ends up creating so much inequality that it uh, sort of uh, shoots itself in the foot because the inequality it creates keeps the people in the common economy from being able to consume enough to keep pumping the growth that the system needs in order to uh, keep the wealth extraction siphon going. So the seeds of capitalism's demise were always within itself, is, what is our argument in the book. Um, and of course, our book isn't just about breaking down and deconstructing the for-profit economy. Um, we are putting forth a, a different economic model based on not-for-profit business and the vision of a not-for-profit uh, market economy. So. Um, hmm. I've totally lost track of time. <laughs> How much time do I have now? Two minutes, okay. So I would like to take those last two minutes to just give you a bit of the utopian vision um, that we do put forth in our book. So basically what we see happening in a not-for-profit world economy, and the, the name of our model is the not-for-profit world. Um, so moving from what we have today, the for-profit world, to the not-for-profit world. Um, and the not-for-profit world is based around businesses that are not for profit. So this is basically a new player that we're seeing in the economy. This isn't some sort of idea that we came up with. This is a, based on current trends that we see all over the world. Um, so it's, we've seen this sort of happening in two different uh, trends. We have seen nonprofits going into business more and more, so traditional charities that are, are dependent on charity and philanthropy and grants. Um, are not getting those uh, sources of funding anymore as much as they used to. And so they're going into business to support the work that they do. Um, and then we're also seeing entrepreneurs starting up their businesses as not-for-profits because they don't, they're seeing that they, they sense the flaw in the for-profit world and they want uh, purpose to be at the center of their business. Um, yeah, so what would a, a market economy, so again, this is about re-envisioning the market re-envisioning the economy. Uh, what would a market economy based on not-for-profit business look like? Well, we argue that it would allow for a lot more well-being because it wouldn't, um, if, all, if every business in the economy is based around a social or environmental purpose and all of the profit has to go into that social or environmental purpose um, because there are no owners of these not-for-profit businesses, then you get uh, an economy that no longer has to go. It might not be degrowing, it might not um, mean zero growth, but it no longer has that built-in function where it has to grow to allow capitalists to accumulate wealth. Um, it doesn't have the wealth extraction siphon anymore. Um, so it allows for more well-being because there's no longer the, the pressure to consume that there once was in order for 
the uh, businesses in the market to uh, maximize their profit. It also, in, in reducing the pressure to consume, it reduces the pressure on the natural environment because there's less throughput, or, or at least it allows for less throughput. Um, and then it, there would be more equality because there are no longer, like I said, there are no uh, owners of not-for-profit businesses. So the wealth extraction siphon that we have now through for-profit business no longer exists. Um, yeah, so sort of changed the order of things I was going to talk about, but that's fine. <laughs> um, and so this not-for-profit world would take us beyond the, the market and state dichotomy that so many of us have been talking about while we're at the degrowth conference. And I remember from the Leipzig degrowth de conference, a lot of talks were centered around this market-state dichotomy. Well, what if you re-envision the market to be purpose-oriented rather than profit-oriented? Um, so I'll leave it there, and then I've got yeah, I'll say more in the next round. Thank you very much. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really amazed that, that all the structural issues were brought in to our discussion and also this narrative storytelling part of all social science research we are doing uh, on these issues. So, but I would, I would really love to build on your uh, ground level experiences, hear something about what other stories are created, compelling stories which challenges the capitalocentric logic. So, Susan, what's your experience in Latin America? How many people here have heard of Buen Bibit? Look at that. An abstract idea that has traveled all around the world with no bodies, no context. Pretty amazing, huh? Just like that capitalism that Danielle described. Not only did he describe it as a concept free of cultural or historical context, but he even said there was no empirical reality of capitalism, no actual capitalist state, right? I'm real confused about Buen Bibit. Um, and I'm going to just give you a few examples that will help to figure out. So I lived 10 years in Bolivia, much of it in communities that people describe as extremely isolated, no contact with modern world, whatever. Um, people all the time, every minute, with their bodies, with the way they moved, with the way they interacted, expressed a desire to live well or properly in relation to human and other nature. It happened a few moments I can describe. Before plowing a field to plant seeds, people cook and bury a special meal and say thank you to Pachamama. Please receive this gift and reciprocate by getting nourishment for our family. When people clean the canals for irrigation, they give liquor and mention to every mountaintop where the water comes and comes down. It's just built into lives. And I don't imagine that any people I knew could talk about Buen Rivera as a concept. That's actually a Spanish word that's it's quite, kind of an invention based on Quechua and Aymara understandings, right? Um, when it did become quite explicit was when things went wrong. And it was quite common for people to say things like, one guy in particular, an elder man, he had a stroke. And people say, well, of course. It's because he was hassling his son-in-law and, and harassing him and not letting him grow into a man like he should have. That's why. Someone had a plague in his potatoes and they said, well, of course. He wasn't following the traditional rhythm of fallows and planting and crop rotation. It was out of equilibrium. Obviously, he's going to have problems. So sort of the moment when it maybe was most explicit was in dealing with those moments of disequilibrium that happen in, in human and environmental degradation or illness or conflict. Um, what's happened, though, is at least in Bolivia and Ecuador, Government officials 
deputies, other people have said, wow, this is a wonderful idea. Let's build it into the Constitution and into our public policies. But that's a whole different realm of abstract ideas like capitalism. And then it gets real confused because we have people say, oh yeah, that idea, Brain Vivir, that's bullshit. It has nothing to do, look at that community. You know, a, a man in that community stole from another man. Brain Vivir is not true. And so there's this real conflict between what I experience as an embodied, deep relation of movement and feeling and sensation with the environment and what has to be an abstract concept to put into laws and constitution and policies. And I'm still sort of struggling to figure that out. I'm going to say a few words about a steady state economy because George asked me to, to say a little bit about it in terms of an example perhaps of, of transition. And so I've already said that this idea of a steady state economy is an economy where material and energy use are, are stabilized and, and kept within ecological limits. And this, this really goes back to Herman Daly in the, in the 1970s. And the thing to notice about this definition is it's entirely biophysical. Uh, GDP isn't mentioned, uh, social goals are not mentioned, political economy is not mentioned. It's just about stabilizing resource use within environmental limits. Um, so degrowth, in a sense, is actually a much broader project in terms of what it's, it's advocating for because social equity and various other things are, are part of that discourse. And so you might think of the idea of a steady state economy as probably a necessary um, result of degrowth, something it's striving towards, one of the goals, but certainly not, not the only one. Um, but that also doesn't mean that to achieve a steady state economy that quite fundamental transformations to the social and economic systems are not needed. Although it's a simple biophysical definition, carrying it out could mean very sweeping changes uh, across society. And so in 2010, we tried to figure out a bit more about what would actually be required. And so we held a, a conference in Leeds, which was the world's first steady state economy conference. Uh, at about 250 people attended and contributed towards this. And the goal was to try and articulate some of these, these broader changes that would, would be needed. And we wrote a nice little report called Enough is Enough, and we put it up on our web page, and we kind of thought, okay, well, we're done with this, this project, and I went back to my day job. And um, <clears throat> we were rather surprised by the response. You know, it was downloaded over 25,000 times in the first couple months. Um, it was in the newspaper, it was featured on Italian television for some reason, which still no one really understands. And um, so we decided to keep working on this and, and turned it into the book, also creatively called Enough is Enough, and then the film, which is, you guessed it, Enough is Enough, and soon, I don't know what we'll have next, but... Um, and uh, I don't have time to tell you about all of the ideas that came out of this, but I just want to kind of pick on three which I think are relevant to this discussion. And, and the first of these is this issue of, of equality and, and inequality, which I think is a real problem for, for capitalism that is creating inequality. And so how do we, we deal with that? You know, how do we create a system that, that deals with these vested power interests and deals with escalating inequality? And this is there's not a trivial, simple answer to this, although people like myself often kind of try and provide one. Um, you know, we talk about the idea of, of a minimum and a maximum income, let's say. Uh, and by a minimum income, I don't mean a low hourly wage conditional on working at McDonald's. I mean a basic entitlement available to every citizen, regardless of whether they're working or not, I mean, universal or, or citizen's income. Uh, there was a survey recently that showed that about 68% of people across the European Union supported this idea. Uh, there's pilot projects of it happening next year in both Finland and the Netherlands. So, you know, watch this space on the, the topic of a basic income. A maximum income, you know, probably a lot harder to implement in practice. There are some people who wouldn't be so crazy about this idea, you know, these capitalist guys. Um, but it's critical, I think, if we're going to achieve the degrowth project, if we're going to remove power from these vested interests who would try to oppose change. And so I think we need to try and figure out seriously how we might, might do this. Um, you know, things used to be kind of different. Inequality has increased quite substantially since the 1980s, largely because we have lowered taxes on people at the upper levels 
of, of income. And so if you look in the United States, the highest marginal tax rate was 90% up until 1964. You know, currently it's 40, 45%, uh, something like that. In Britain, uh, the highest rate was 83% up until the 70s. And, and get this, it was 98% on investment income. You know, can you imagine proposing that in these days? In Britain at the moment, they're fighting over whether it should be 18% or 20%. So things have, things have very much changed. And so again, I think we really need to try and move back towards a, a system where we're, we're taxing people at the top a lot more. Um, second thing we need to do, and this is always my favorite one to, to theorize about, is working time reduction. Uh, in Clive's contribution this morning, you know, he was critical of this idea often put forward by, by people like myself in the steady state and degrowth community that we could use the benefits of increases in labor productivity to reduce our working hours while keeping the same salaries. Um, because without fossil fuels, if we remove those from the picture, then maybe it's very difficult to do that. And that could very well be right. Um, and so that leaves us with the other option, which is to reduce our working hours and thus reduce our incomes at the same time. And you might say, well, people would never go for that. But again, there's been surveys done of this which show there's actually a lot more support for it than you might think. In the OECD, 40% of people said that they would quite happily reduce uh, their working hours and their incomes at the same time um, if they could. And so I think if we can just provide you know, freedoms to allow people to, to, to choose their working hours, then this would be quite, hopefully quite effective. Um, the third thing that we, that we need to do, and this is near and dear to my, my own heart and the sorts of things I work on, is change the way that we measure progress. Uh, at the moment, we use GDP, which is a terrible measure of, of economic progress. You know, the BP disaster in the Gulf of, Gulf of Mexico um, has, uh, you know, did all sorts of untold damage, but the Wall Street Journal actually said, well, this was good for US GDP. Um, even though it cost $40 billion to clean up the mess, um, a lot of jobs were created, you know, 4,000 jobs were created cleaning up that mess. Only 3,000 were lost in the moratorium on oil exploration, so we came out ahead. You know, what kind of measures of progress are those? And so I would argue we need to replace GDP, get rid of it. Uh, replace it with measures of human well-being, the things that we want to maximize, or at least increase, like human happiness and health and equality and employment. Um, and at the same time, measure resource use, material footprint, CO2 footprint. These are the things we want to reduce and keep within ecological limits. Um, and I'm going to say that a steady state economy is not an economy where the goal is zero growth in GDP. It's an economy where what happens to GDP no longer matters. Okay, great. Um, well, I've, I have been asked to bring in a bit of a, the Greek ex, uh, experience because I have I lived in Greece from um, just before the uh, infamous crisis began until just a couple of months ago. I've just relocated to Stockholm. Um, but before I bring in the, the Greek experience, I do want to just build a little bit on, on um, what has been said and um, and then move into the Greek experience. Um, yeah, so uh, th there's really interesting things in terms of thinking about, it almost feels like this round is more about like a transition. We've sort of talked about what's going on with capitalism and growth, um, and this is more about sort of what, what do we need in order to move away from that? Um, and Dan just brought in some really great ideas. Um, one of the things that I would bring in is, is uh, going back to the proposal that the Post Growth Institute is putting forward, um, that basic income and no longer measuring GDP as the only measure of success are very important. Um, and so are changing our stories and understanding that there are different ways of seeing the world and being in the world rather than just focusing on accumulation and um, having more and more. Um, but it's also um, really important to understand that the business models that we have right now in the economy, the for-profit economy based on the for-profit business model, um, 
necessitates these sorts of things. It necessitates and um, reinforces the for-profit story. That's how we refer to this sort of the story. It's been called many things. You can call it, um, Charles Eisenstein calls it the story of separation. There are many different, it goes deeper than just talking about the profit motive. Um, but so we do need to go beyond the business models and the structure of the the structural aspects of the economy that reinforce um, and thrive on this for-profit story. Um, and so one thing that I, I would like to just throw in here is that um, you know maybe our utopia, the not-for-profit world, and I haven't given you enough information about it to really judge it yet. If you want to know more, by the way, <laughs> I'll plug my, my presentation tomorrow. Um, I have a book presentation about our upcoming book tomorrow at 4.30. It's part of the degrowth week. Um, and it's in one of the rooms in this building. Um, so if you want to know more about the specifics of that, you can come. But um, what, what my main point here is, I just want to say, we, the, going beyond the for-profit world is necessary. It's not sufficient necessarily, and there could be many other measures that we need to take, but we must go beyond the for-profit economy. We must go beyond for-profit business models at the center of our economy. Um, now then, I, I would just like to, I'll change the note a little bit and bring in some of the Greek experience or the experiences that I have in Greece. I shouldn't say the Greek experience as if I represent Greece because I'm, I don't have a, a drop of Greek blood in my body. But um, I, in terms of thinking about how we transition to whatever sort of vision we might have of, of a post-growth or a degrowth economy, it's really important to think about how change happens. Um, and that's one of the biggest lessons that I've learned in Greece and living through the, the crisis there the last seven years. In, and I have been sort of in the heart of it all. I've, I live in a, a part of Athens called Exarchia. And uh, if you've ever seen dumpsters on fire or riots, <laughs> that's my neighborhood. <laughs> so um, I have actually experienced the crisis quite intimately and seen uh, the unemployment go up in friends and family that I have there and seen homelessness go up on my street and seen narcotics use go up on my street and experienced all of that. Um, and so it, I've often been asked, of course, as a foreigner living through the Greek crisis, um, you know, what's it like? And, and I often see there's this polarized um, approach to change and to crisis. And it's either all doom and gloom. You read so many newspaper articles about the Greek crisis over in Greece, it's far away, and, and it's just all homelessness and poverty, and it's just all of these really negative things. Um, but then I've also been moving in new economy circles a lot, and degrowth circles, and a lot of people in those circles have asked me, oh, the Greek, you know, Greece is creating a new economy, and it's so exciting, and it's this beacon of hope for all of us who want to change the economy. And I think my biggest lesson from living there is that it's um, change is complex and crisis is complex. And uh, it's all of those things. It's doom and gloom and it is um, a beacon of hope and it's all of those things mixed together and it's really messy. And I say this because uh, crisis isn't going away and it's not gonna just stay in Greece and Italy and Southern Europe and, and the global south. Crisis is going to keep increasing as long as we have the structural issues and the, the cultural crisis that we have that Susan so well articulated. This, um, uh, there's a scholar from the UK, I think his name is Stephen Sterling, who articulated it very well, that the crises we're seeing right now is a crisis of perception and meaning of the Western culture, of Western civilization, sorry. Um, and so the, the, the economic crises we're having right now aren't going anywhere. They're going to stay as long as we have this deeper crisis of meaning, perception, and Western civilization. Um, and so I would say lessons to take away from, from watching Greece, from living in Greece and other countries that are in crisis is just sort of embrace the complexity um, to not to try to get away from black and white thinking or linear thinking that there's one way of going about it. Um, change and crisis is happening on so many different levels and it does open up, we've seen in Greece, it opens up um, because people are pushed out of their comfort zones by crisis. It opens up uh, 
the way of thinking, it, it creates an openness for new ways of thinking, for new ideas, for trying out things that you never would have tried out before because you were too comfortable in your habits and your routines. And I've seen this in all sorts of initiatives and um, activism popping up all over Greece and really getting strong. Um, and so there's, you know, there is silver lining, um, but it's important to acknowledge both. There is doom and gloom, there is silver lining, and the trajectory of all of this is still unclear. And that, again, also leaves us a lot of hope because that means we can sort of steer that trajectory. So. So thanks again. Um, I, I should share my uh, slight confusion now or confusing feeling that... that uh, I, I, I learn stories of embodied experience and I learn stories of structural changes we should instigate uh, and I again learn stories from bottom up, messy hybrid uh, movement solutions so but how they what are the challenges then the key challenges to the growth as a movement as a social movement what can and we learn how to connect this embodied experiences in the field with structural moves, how we avoid this abstraction in the constitution, uh, distracting this embodied experience, your experience in Latin America. Uh, if there are vested interests and stories very powerful, then how uh, basic income or the reduced working hour will take place? So I mean, I'm confused as a scholar of business, what should I do? <laughs> How to uh, go for a not-for-profit story which makes sense to my uh, shareholders or my other constituents. So I really look for some very basic key messages which you can share very sharply. I suggest that we look out here for some answers. <laughs> <laughs> I think, whoa, it's very loud. Um, in terms of challenges to degrowth, I think the biggest challenge to degrowth is the vested interests that would oppose it. And these vested interests don't just include the banks or the 62 billionaires who now control half of the world's wealth. They include national governments who are dependent on economic growth for taxation. They include pension funds who are dependent on economic growth to pay people into retirement. They include trade unions who are dependent on economic growth through employment. And they include all of us. And I think as Susan has pointed out, you know, the, the, this capitalist system that we have at the moment, it just didn't arise as a historical accident, uh, you know, there's people who have been promoting it very, very strongly in trying to, to keep this system going. Um, has anyone here come across the Powell Memorandum before? Oh good, okay, well let me share. Um, so I, I brought it along. So Lewis Powell was an attorney in the United States in the early 1970s. And so he wrote a memorandum um, to the head of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And Powell at the time, he was very concerned by these leftist perspectives, you know, people like us, um, who were undermining the American capitalist system. And so he wrote a memo that was called Attack on the American Free Enterprise System. Scary stuff. Because um, at the time, things weren't going that well for the whole neoliberal project. And so, Powell, you know, he wrote this, this memorandum and he said uh, a number of interesting things that here, here he said that we're, we're not dealing with sporadic or isolated attacks from a small number of extremists or even from a minority socialist cadre. Um, rather, the assault on the enterprise system is broadly based and consistently pursued. It is gaining momentum and converts. And the most disquieting voices joining the chorus of criticism come from perfectly respectable citizens. So he argued um, in 1971 that the time has come, indeed it is long overdue, for the wisdom, ingenuity, and resources of American businesses to be marshaled against those 
who would destroy the system. And Powell proposed a quite radical series of inter interventions to shore up American capitalisms. Uh, and, and these included things like strategic appointments of university professors across the US, um, incentives to encourage more publishing by scholars who believed in, in the free enterprise system, a staff of highly competent speakers to try and sway and influence public opinion, uh, the critique of university textbooks that were off message and the monitoring of television programs. And again, he wrote, the national television networks should be monitored in the same way that textbooks should be kept under constant surveillance. Complaints should be made promptly and strongly when the programs are unfair or inaccurate. Um, and it wasn't just these actions. He also called for direct political action and for an army of lawyers to exert pressure on the court system. And so he wrote again that there should not be the slightest hesitation to press vigorously in all political arenas for support of the enterprise system, nor should there be reluctance to penalize politically those who oppose it. And the thing is, a number of these things were, were acted upon. And two months after writing the memorandum, uh, Lewis Powell was appointed by President Nixon to the Supreme Court in the United States. So I would argue that if we're serious about achieving systemic change, then we need the equivalent of a Powell Memorandum for degrowth. <laughs> I would say we need to do at least three things. Um, we need to try and discredit the current economic narrative to show where it's not working, um, this whole idea that we can have green growth, uh, to show where it's false, that austerity is necessary, and to show where it contradicts our values, this whole notion that competition is inherently a good thing. Um, we also need to build partnerships, first of all with other economists who are also critical of, of the system, but also with NGOs, with businesses, with activists, with civil servants, with, with journalists. And we need to try and establish a shared vision um, of this new economy. And I use the word vision rather than narrative because I, I don't think narrative goes far enough. I think it needs to be a positive vision, not some, some image of you know, freezing in the dark under an eco-dictatorship, but a hopeful transition to a better world uh, that's united by cooperation rather than competition. And uh, in Lewis Powell's words, uh, just to close this comment here, uh, he said, strength lies in organization, in careful long-range planning and implementation, in consistency of action over an indefinite period of years, in the scale of financing available only through joint effort, and in the political power available only through united action. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, coming off of what Dan just said, um, in our book in, about the not-for-profit world, in our book How on Earth, um, which by the way is the title How on Earth, and we do have an entire part of the book, uh, which is how on earth do we transition? How on earth do we get from here, from this for-profit world we have now, to there, which is our idea, our utopian vision of a not-for-profit world. Um, or you could just substitute that with any sort of post-growth or degrowth vision um, or utopian vision. And so this includes, this part of our book includes two, two main um, threads, basically. And one of it has to do with challenges. Um, because what we see now is uh, this for-profit machine, right? This for-profit economy. And it's very, very strong and it seems like impenetrable. And there's certainly going to be some sort of resistance and there already is a lot of resistance. Again, you can come to Greece and see the sort of resistance that the for-profit um, economy and the for-profit owners have to any sort of change or crisis. Um, so there's active resistance, like the Powell Memorandum sort of thing. But there's also a lot of inertia, and uh, Dan just touched on that a bit, and that goes a lot into what Susan's been saying about the narratives and the, the cultural um, aspects that underlie our economic system. So we, we, we're looking at resistance, just outward 
um, resistance. We're looking at inertia, and we all sort of play a part in that inertia in changing the stories, in confronting these ideas about our own human nature and what drives us and what motivates our behavior. Um, but so the, there is a lot of inertia, there is a lot of resistance, but it's also really important to understand that this system is in crisis for a reason. It's collapsing in on itself. The for-profit system, the for-profit economy is by nature unsustainable. Like I said before, it's even economically, even if uh, ecological and social issues were not a problem, economically it's in, unstable because it requires growth constantly, which the inequality that it itself creates um, impedes. So the inequality it creates impedes the growth it needs. So this is an inherently unstable uh, system. And so it, it is falling down on itself. The question is what's coming up in its place? And again, you could look at, at Greece sort of as a microcosm of this because in, rea in response to the crisis, you see this whole broad range of reactions. You see these grassroots initiatives popping up, which are very much uh, the embodiment of the not-for-profit story or a story of interconnectedness um, that acknowledges that we're all in this together and if my community's not doing well, then I'm not and vice versa. Um, so you see these, these sort of initiatives popping up and, and uh, a lot of solidarity, and they call it the solidarity economy a lot in Greece. Um, but we've also seen, and I'm sure you've read in the news, the, the rise of far-right extremist parties. I mean, the Golden Dawn, Chrysiavi, which is a neo-Nazi party, basically, in Greece. And we've seen this, basically everything in between, that people feel helpless or powerless in the face of crises. Um, they feel like there's nothing they can do to change things, or um, we just want to go back to the good old days, and we're going to wait till the, the right politicians or the right experts come along to take us back there. So there's this whole range of, of reactions, and um, the important thing is for us to be able to, to steer and support the initiatives and the, the businesses and all and the narratives and the cultural changes that we see happening um, that are already going in the direction that we want to go in because there is so much out there. It really, there are so many um, beautiful, wonderful things happening. So it's just about supporting those, connecting those. Um, and, uh, and it's happening because even with not-for-profit business, for instance, we see the rise of not-for-profit business business, the, the whole reason I can even uh, tell you about this model is because it's on the rise. And the reason it's on the rise is because in reaction to our changing um, challenges and needs in the 21st century, uh, young entrepreneurs and nonprofits are going into business based on social and environmental purpose because they want to use business in a way that helps solve the crises that we're seeing. So even that there's this crisis, the system's collapsing, and there's a response to this crisis. Um, and there are some more positive responses than others. So I think there's a lot of hope. Like I said before, the trajectory is unclear. There are a lot of challenges. There are, there's a lot of resistance and inertia. But the more aware of it we are, and the more aware of the things that are already happening that are beautiful and great, the, the better we are, uh, the, yeah, the more well-equipped we are to build up the alternatives we want to see.